Back propagation, the most intuitive lesson, yet the hardest to grasp in mathematical terms. We will first explore the intuition behind it, then look into the mathematics. Okay? And yes, math is optional, but we would like to encourage you to look at it to gain a better understanding. You shouldn't skip this lesson though, as it's the fun part of back propagation. Let's start from the other side of the coin, forward propagation. Forward propagation is the process of pushing inputs through the net. At the end of each epoch, the obtained outputs are compared to the targets to form the errors. Then, we back propagate through partial derivatives and change each parameter so errors at the next epoch are minimized. For the minimal example, the back propagation consisted of a single step, aligning the weights given the errors we obtained. Here's where it gets a little tricky. When we have a deep net, we must update all the weights related to the input layer and the hidden layers. For example, in this famous picture, we have 270 weights. And yes, this means we had to manually draw all 270 arrows you see here. So, updating all 270 weights is a big deal. But wait, we also introduced activation functions. This means we have to update the weights accordingly, considering the used nonlinearities and their derivatives. Finally, to update the weights, we must compare the outputs to the targets. This is done for each layer, but we have no targets for the hidden units. We don't know the errors. So how do we update the weights? That's what backpropagation is all about. We must derive the appropriate updates as if we had targets. Now. The way academics solve this issue is through errors. The main point is that we can trace the contribution of each unit, hidden or not, to the error of the output. Okay, in the next lesson, we will provide an illustration of the backpropagation concept. Our net is quite simple. It has a single hidden layer. Each node is labeled, so we have inputs x1 and x2. Hidden layer units, output layer units y1 and y2, and finally, the targets T1 and T2. The weights are W11, W12, W13, W21, W22, and W23 for the first part of the net. For the second part, we named them U11, U12, U21, U22, U31, and U32, so we can differentiate between the two types of weights. That's very important. We know the error associated with y1 and y2, as it depends on known targets. So, let's call the two errors e1 and e2. Based on them, we can adjust the weights labeled with u. Each u contributes to a single error. For example, u11 contributes to e1. Then, we find its derivative and update the coefficient. Nothing new here. Now, let's examine w11. W11 helped us predict H1, but then we needed H1 to calculate Y1 and Y2. Thus, it played a role in determining both errors, E1 and E2. So, while U11 contributes to a single error, W11 contributes to both errors. Therefore, its adjustment rule must be different. The solution to this problem is to take the errors and backpropagate them through the net, using the weights. Knowing the U weights, we can measure the contribution of each hidden unit to the respective errors. Then, once we've found out the contribution of each hidden unit to the respective errors, we can update the W weights. So essentially, through backpropagation, the algorithm identifies which weights lead to which errors. Then, it adjusts the weights that have a bigger contribution to the errors by more than the weights with a smaller contribution. A big problem arises when we must also consider the activation functions. They introduce additional complexity to this process. Linear contributions are easy, but nonlinear ones are tougher. Imagine backpropagating in our introductory net. Once you understand it, it seems very simple. While pictorially straightforward, mathematically, it is rough to say the least. That is why backpropagation is one of the biggest challenges for the speed of an algorithm.